109 um, genomes that belong to the C12 variant in South Africa. Um, so the potential, it is a variant, uh, definitely it is a variant, but I think the potential comes in where, um, as, we, as we've kind of tried to highlight, uh, is that it has the potential for concern um, because it has all these mutations that are either shared with other variants of concern or that are novel and are present in kind of um, regions of the virus that we think would have some kind of functional impact. So that's where the potential comes in. It definitely is a variant, but it is not yet a variant of concern or a variant of interest. It, ha it has the potential to become one. Um, and as Kathy mentioned, um, it will really only become a variant of interest or concern when it is more um, widely dispersed and when it's detected at higher frequencies. Um, and then also if it has a functional impact, increased transmissibility or um, increased disease severity and things like that. Um, yes, most of the genomes that have been identified globally are from South Africa. There's really only a handful um, that are not from South Africa. All right, thank you for that. I'm going to go through to the next question, which is from Nicole. Um, she's from ITL Television. She's asking if there are so many new mutations on this variant, how can we be so confident that vaccines are working? Professor Pennymo, please take this one. Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a good question. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the things that we're urgently doing um, in, in several labs in South Africa is assessing this directly. And um, what that entails is taking sera, uh, blood from people who've been vaccinated um, with um, either of the two vaccines that we have in South Africa, and also from people who were infected with COVID, uh, with SARS-CoV-2, had COVID-19 and have recovered. And what we do is we, um, we grow the virus C12 in a lab, and we actually physically test the antibodies um, from those people, vaccinees or convalescent donors, against the virus to assess that. And that data we hope will be out in the next couple of weeks. But the reason that we are fairly confident um, that um, despite the number of new mutations that we're seeing is, is two, several reasons, but the two most important probably are that as we've mentioned, several of these mutations are mutations that we know. Um, we have a lot of data from a lot of the other variants um, and we know the effect of these mutations on, on the virus. So we can to some extent predict um, the effect of those mutations even in the context of C12. And the other reason is that um, for protection from severe disease um, is mediated by a, um, a separate arm of the immune system often um, from the antibodies that we hear so much about in the press, um, T cells. And T cells are much more uh, tolerant of mutations. There's considerable emerging data from, from many labs across the world um, that shows that although you, you may see a reduction in the ability of antibodies to bind to many of these um, emerging variants, T cells, which are the ones that do protect you from severe disease, T cells maintain almost all of their activity against the variants that we have so far. So while we don't yet have hard data and we're working as hard as we can and as quickly as we can to get you those answers, this is the reason that we remain fairly confident that despite the number of increased mutations in this variant is that the vaccines that we have will still protect against severe disease. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. While you're still on, um, I have a question from Tanya. So she's seen a preprint from uh, Professor de Oliveira um, suggesting that the frequency is low, but that it is gaining traction at the same rate as the Delta did in the early days. So from this, can we assume that it will grow exponentially? So I think that this, the preprint that, um, that Tanya is referring to is in fact the preprint that we're, it's the same preprint that we're talking about. Um, as Janelle showed in her uh, graphs, uh, it is at a very low frequency. If you remember the purple slices of that graph, it's at somewhere between two and 3%. But as we track it, it, do, it is gaining um, slightly. Um, this is the reason we're watching it with such interest is that um, it is doing to some extent what Delta did at the beginning of the second wave. At this stage, it's, it's impossible. It's crystal ball stuff. Um, and we've learned from, from this pandemic not to predict what variants do. Um, so at this stage, we, we are watching it carefully, we're counting the number of genomes, we're counting where the genomes are and, and tracking, tracking this variant. But at this stage, I do not think that we can say anything beyond that. We are watching it extremely carefully. 
Um, thank you so much, Prof. Um, I want to bring in Prof. Adrian Purin. Um, I've got a question from uh, Noel Kanya. Noel Kanya, if you don't mind, I'm going to break up your questions. You've sent us five questions. I'm going to break them up because they have to be responded to by different experts. So question five from Noel Kanya, Prof, is uh, based on, um, sorry, um, so she's asking, is there any need at this point to review lockdown restriction in anticipating um, for what will come from this variant? Thank you very much for, for that question. No, I, I don't think that there's any need at this time. I think all the um, regulations that, that are required in terms of managing this current um, third wave or resurgence is in place. And I think regardless of the variant at this time, um, I don't think that there's any need for us to reconsider um, what, what is actually currently happening in terms of our current controls and the variant. I think it's, it's going to be more or less around what's happening in the individual provinces. As you know, it's a more heterogeneous um, resurgence that we're currently experiencing. So I think it's more likely that our focus is going to be around what we can do in each particular province, but it's not really going to be influenced by the, the current variant at, at all. Um, I would like to also emphasize again those key points are around those non-pharmaceutical interventions and really encouraging people to be vaccinated. I think that that's going to be very important. Thank you very much for the question there. Very important. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, I have a few more uh, questions from Nobukanya from Jacaranda. Um, uh, Dr. Biman, if you uh, could please answer these ones. So she wants to know which provinces uh, has the C.1.2 lineage uh, been dominant in? Um, so just a breakdown of, um, of that provincially. And secondly, she wants to know, uh, scientists have referred to the lineage, um, have uh, mutations similar to previous variants. She's asking why is this significant? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, and she's asking further if, if this is a, a precursor to it being classified as a variant of concern. Um, thanks for those questions, Nuku Kanya. So in terms of um, dominant provinces, I wouldn't say there is one um, where this is more dominant than the other. And this is simply because um, our sequencing efforts are not equal in all of our provinces. Um, so for example, we do have much better coverage in Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal in the Western Cape than we do in some of the other provinces. So we obviously therefore have detected um, this uh, variant or this lineage um, in many more sequences in Gauteng. So I wouldn't say that that says that it's more dominant in Gauteng. I think it's more reflective of, of, our, of our sequencing efforts. Um, uh, so, so in terms then of the mutations and, and the mutations that are shared with other variants of concern. So this is, this is important because we know what the impact of those mutations are in the other variants of concern. Um, because, you know, they've been circulating for a while, they've infected a large number of individuals, so we really have been able to, number one, pinpoint um, what is the impact of individual mutations in these variants of concern, and then number two, um, what is their combined um, impact in a particular lineage or in a particular variant. So, that, so that's why when you see another lineage that's emerging that has similar mutations, um, you do we, we become concerned. Um, similarly, uh, simply because we already know that they have um, a kind of detrimental impact. Um, and then the last question was, sorry, was that the frequency question? At what point does it become a problem? So in terms of um, assigning this a, as a variant of interest or a variant well, firstly, as a variant of interest and then as a variant of concern, it has to be present at around 20% um, of sequences for it to become a problem or for it to become something that, for example, um, the WHO would classify then as a variant of interest. So at this point, still relatively low, so not an issue, but at least 20% um, is the typical cutoff. Um, thank you for that, Dr. Bima. And I'm going to ask Dr. Catherine Skippers to um, prepare for this one. So how do you decide when to announce a new variant? Um, um, like, 
you are doing with this one or not, especially given the risk of the impact on sentiment and tourism and travel restriction. Um, there have been many mutations seen in South Africa and globally which have not been announced. And some foreign um, epidemiologists have downplayed the importance of this one. Uh, Dr. Skipper's apologies. I'm going to ask Professor Adrian Kieran to, to take this one. <laughs> apologies for that. Yes, I, I think it's really, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the, re, the the question, and I'm sure um, Catherine can, can add to that as well as um, Janelle. I think that the intention is really just to say that we are monitoring, and I think we need to be transparent that this is what we are currently are doing. This is what we have identified, and as Janelle and and uh, Catherine have have outlined, that there are changes on this particular virus that or this particular lineage that um, we know are part of. Uh, mutations that we've seen for the variants of concern, of variants of, of, of interest. So I think it's really critical for us to be aware of that and not be caught on the back foot. Um, were this to gain traction and to fully, further develop to the point where we do see it at 20% and then decisions need to, to be made. So I think it's really uh, critical for us to do that. And we've seen that with, with the Delta. I think we made some announcements about the, the Delta um, that, that the numbers were fairly low, but given the nature of Delta, it suddenly became overwhelming. And, and as you know, that that is the dominant um, virus or lineage in, in circulation. So I think it's really important for us um, to make the public aware that this is what is in circulation. This is what is potentially could happen, uh, but we're not saying it is happening. So we really just want to lay concerns around that because we don't have the evidence that currently this is a, a, a variant that will develop to the, the level of a variant of interest or of concern, but just to make the public aware that it is there and we are actually monitoring this particular variant. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Um, Dr. Skippers, this one is really for you. It's from Christian um, Duplessis. He wants to know, would it be fair to describe the C.1.2 as the most mutated uh, variant in the world? So from the data that we um, have seen, so what we do is we compare um, the sequences that we've detected to what we see um, globally circulating. And um, this particular variant C12 has um, up to 59 mutations across its entire genome. Um, and this is quite a lot. On average, the variants of um, concern and variants of interest, they have around 25 or so. Um, so it's, it's, it is quite mutated, um, but as everyone has alluded to, we continue to monitor these viruses. Um, and um, as the pandemic grows, the virus also continues to evolve. So this will also be um, an evolving situation, um, so to speak. Um, but yeah, it is, it is quite mutated compared to other variants. Um, thank you, Dr. Skippers. Um, another question. This one is from Catherine Child. Um, why do we say it's mostly in South Africa when it has been found in Switzerland, in China, England and Mauritius? Is it just being better detected here or is it really more common in South Africa? So thank you also for that question. Um, so we, we monitor um, the number of sequences that um, are assigned to this particular lineage. We think that um, it evolved from um, a precursor called C1, which was predominant in South Africa in our first wave. So it's very likely that C12 also, um, well, came out of that virus and then um, originated here in South Africa. So of those um, 105 or so sequences that we've seen of C1 globally, majority of them over 90 or so are from South Africa. I wouldn't say that our surveillance is better than everywhere else. I think um, we are doing well, but there are other countries that are sequencing um, exponentially more, I think, um, than us. And so it's just that they detect it at very low levels. I think we're not seeing a global spread um, of this particular virus um, to the level that we see within South Africa. But we, we, this is why we're continuing to monitor it. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Skippers. I think uh, we have um, dealt with most of the questions. Um, I'm just doing a run through. Um, Prof, uh, Adrian Puren, if you would please just uh, get ready to close for us. 
and um, thank our colleagues from the media just for participating and for um, engaging with us um, during this time. I just want to check if we haven't missed any questions, but Prof, I'll hand over to you while I do a run through of um, all the questions. Um, just colleagues, I have noted all the questions that are on here and we will be doing an FAQ, which will be shared with you um, electronically. So if we did miss some of the questions, please forgive us. It was not um, by intention. So um, yeah, I'll hand over to Professor Adrian Puren to make the closing remarks. Um, Prof, you are on mute. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank you all very much, um, colleagues, for attending this particular um, presentation, and I hope that we have been able to provide you with all the necessary information to inform you and to inform um, your various publics um, about what's um, happening with this particular variant. Our intention, as I said, was really in the interests of scientific transparency in terms of saying what is in circulation and what are the potential implications. We understand that these... Um, announcements do have implications around, for example, um, the economy and with regard to, to travel, but we hope that we've allayed the concerns that this will be monitored and that we are aware of the implications around the, um, this particular variant, but that I think we need to be in a state of, of preparedness and of course still emphasizing the fact that all those regulations in terms of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the vaccinations are really critical uh, in, in order for us to control um, the variants. It's not going to go away. We will see other variants arise, maybe even different variants, maybe even more uh, potentially a harmful variants in terms of vaccine responses. But at least at this particular point, we have at least the theoretical knowledge as to what will happen with regard to the outcomes of our laboratory experiments. But we hope that we can confirm these. So thank you very much again um, for your um, attention. Um, I'd like to thank all our speakers, Dr. Catherine Skippers, thank you so much um, for making time, Dr. Janelle Beeman, um, Professor Pennymore, as well as Professor Adrian Puren, we're really grateful for your time today. Um, and we want to thank, as the NICD, all our media colleagues as well for your engagement and making time in such short notice to attend this media Q&A. Um, the intention was to answer um, as many questions as possible for, for you, and we hope we're able to do that. Furthermore, like I've said, we'll produce an FAQ based on some of the questions that you've asked and the answers from some of our experts that will be shared with you electronically. Also, this press conference recording will be made available to you via our YouTube channel. So I'd like to thank you so much um, as I close this meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.